experience and thank you all uh, for the prayers because I've never experienced anything like this, but um, everything is straight now. Um, Lady Hankerson was like uh, Superman. She came here and everything. She's a IT guru and all of that. And so nevertheless, let's get back into where we were at. Um, I know some of you, this is a later time getting on at seven o'clock, but for those that will have to slip off, we do understand. And even for the Zoom group that is going to be um, uh, going into the webcast or the uh, Zoom at 7.30, you can continue on. But I'm going to finish what we started. I'm going to finish what we started. We're going to finish this um, lesson for today. Yeah, everything, Brother Rodney Johnson, what's amazing is I was talking about a storm and there's a thunderstorm on the way to my understanding and just everything was uh, knocked out. And so we actually had to go in as if we were starting the webcast from scratch. And so again, I appreciate uh, all of that. Okay, looks like YouTube is still tripping, but we're going to go into the word and thank God for you. As I was stating, and just allow me to talk and teach at the same time while I deal with YouTube, I can do all of that in, in one uh, instant here because I want them to make sure that they catch everything. But I was sharing with you all that uh, Peter was from, uh, the Sea of Galilee is also called Lake um, um, uh, Gennesaret, sometimes it's called that as well but we refer to it as the Sea of Galilee. And again, this was an area, and for those of you looking at, what is he looking at? I'm getting YouTube back up. Well, looks like I just lost my uh, periscope. I tell you what, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's what I am going to do. If this thing stops again, what I'm gonna do is go to the, uh, I'm on the Live Center Facebook page. You can just jump over there, and that one doesn't seem to have any issues. You know what the problem is? Everything else is an iPhone, but the Galaxy kept on going. My Lord have mercy. The Android kept on going. And so uh, watch it, Deacon Coach. Don't you start nothing. Please don't start nothing. Isn't that amazing? Sister McBrayer, all of the iPhones shut off, but the Android never shut off. And so if you want to uh, stay... <laughs> And y'all don't bother me about that. Don't you bother me about that. Don't you bother me about that because I've always been an Apple stolic. I'm an Apple stolic, but evidently um, Apple let me down at this time. Let's do this. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see because my periscope went. Yeah, it's just technology. I'm not calling it the devil or nothing like that. You know, the devil this, the devil this. Some things is just technology. What's going on? We have a storm coming through. And so this, let this be an example to you, Minister Webb. You got to minister through the storm. You got to teach through the storm. All right, I brought my periscope back up. But uh, let's do this. I am the type of person I am determined. Sister McBrayer said 30 years ago, she said, that's a determined young man. And so I am determined to uh, finish this lesson tonight on uh, First and Second Peter. Now, let's talk about his religious background. And again, I am actually um, handling YouTube while I talk to you. Peter was actually a sinful individual, even though he was a uh, devout individual. Now, we studied that he had been with Jesus, and um, as a result of that, the people could tell that he was consecrated during his time with Christ. But up to that point, Luke 5 and 8, it says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Lord, I am a sinful man. And so he admitted that he definitely was a um, sinful individual according to Luke chapter 5 verse 8 but nevertheless he was very devout in his faith in God and the scripture says in Acts chapter 10 verse 14 surely not Lord Peter replied I have never eaten anything impure or unclean I tell you what uh, YouTube will just have to go to pot tonight and I'll take you to, I'll take this stream and put on there later on not gonna let that distract us so according to Acts chapter 10, verse 14, Peter said, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. So he was um, devout in that sense that he kept the law, he kept kosher, but he also again says in Luke 5 and 8, I'm a sinful man. Now that goes back to our theme text in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, because you're like, how can you keep kosher? How can you keep the law? Um, but then yet you say you're a sinful man. Now, which one is it? Well, the law was never created in order to save us from our sins. The law was to show us how sinful we were. And so when you look at Peter's life, um, really that's exemplary of what the law was to do. It was to show you your sin, not deliver you from your sin. 
And so the law could not say, was the law bad? No, the law wasn't bad. Was the law evil? No, it wasn't evil. The law was presented to bring us to Christ and to show us that we have that need of salvation in Christ. And so for Peter to say in one sense, Lord, I'm a sinful man, and then to say in another sense, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Because I know some of you can look at Acts 10, 14 and say, well, that's after Acts chapter 2. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost, so surely he's going to say that he's consecrated. But understand, he said, yeah, good to be back. He said, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. I've never had any pork chops. I've never had any catfish. I've never had any crawfish. I've never had any crab, never had any lobster. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So that means his entire life, his whole life, that was the case. Acts 10, 28, he says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So Deacon Coles, watch this. The whole time before becoming born again, before becoming filled with the Holy Ghost, even though um, he was a sinful man, he yet kept that outer law. He wouldn't eat anything unclean. And according to this text, he would not associate with anyone that was not a Jew. He would not associate with anyone that was a Gentile. He wouldn't have anything to do with them. And so here he is now realizing that, of course, that God, you know, is going to bring the Gentiles into the uh, body of Christ and they're going to experience a born again experience. But he was devout. So what that's letting us know is you can be devout and lost. You can be devout and sinful. You can keep all of the laws, all the outward laws and be unclean in here. And we see that actually exemplified in the time that we're in right now. Because again, I heard a preacher say, I need to hurry up and get the people back in the church building in worship service with one another, because if I don't, they're going to backslide. And I thought, oh, how pitiful of a congregation and how pitiful of whatever teaching it is that you're presenting to the people, because if the people are going to backslide in that short amount of time, you know, you may say, well, it's been two months. Yeah, but consider people that have had long illnesses or things like that or people that have to go to war or something or whatever the case may be. You know, it, I, I gave my life to Christ at eight. I'm 48. That's 40 years. And I'm going to say this. If in two months I'm going to backslide because I haven't been in a church setting. Of course, I'm at church every day, obviously, but in a church setting or building with, that's right, Carolyn Curtis, with everybody else in person, then I never really had anything. If I can lose something in two months after supposedly having it 40 years, I really didn't have anything. And I can understand a babe in Christ, somebody that's a babe in Christ or someone that gave their life to Christ and they're living in an environment where no one is saved. They're the only one saved. I can understand that. Someone that just gave their life to Jesus Christ but then when they go back to their home environment, I mean, it's all kinds of things, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all kinds of influences to pull them in another direction. I can definitely understand a baby Christian in that regard. But someone been saved 40 years, you know, and, and for a pastor to say your whole congregation is going to backslide. And most of these Christians have backslid. Um, but understand Look, look at the technology we have where we can yet fellowship. We can yet communicate. And thank all of you that have been praying for me during this when the storm, you know, that's on the way knocked everything out. You know, Lady Hankerson getting here in a short amount of time, trying to make sure everything's okay. Uh, Sister Roach and the saints on there, Deacon leading prayer meeting. Mother Martin, I think I heard your voice, Deacon Colts. I mean, he was reading that word. He was declaring and casting down that enemy. So I thank God that we have some praying people um, in, in the midst of that. And so even though we're not able to shake each other's hand and see each other in person, there's still that sense of fellowship and connectedness. You know, it's one thing to just, and people may say, why are you on every night? Well, that develops a sense of connectedness, a sense of accountability, you know, and you can yet have that even in the midst of not being able to meet um, as we so desire. But again, this is showing us that even though Peter was so devout externally, um, thank you, Campbell Timmons. I appreciate that. On the inside, there was something that was wrong, you know, 
and he, for him to say, I'm a sinful man. You haven't eaten pork your whole life. You've kept kosher your whole life. You haven't associated with Gentiles your whole life. But yet you come into the presence of the living God manifested through his son, Jesus Christ, and you say, I'm a sinful man. If that's not a real life analogy of our theme scripture, I really don't know what is because it says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So you cannot be reconciled to God by honoring the Sabbath. You cannot be reconciled to God by abstaining from certain types of uh, meats. I'm sorry to knock the microphone down. You cannot be reconciled to God for that. Again, is that saying that all of that was bad? Not necessarily so, because Paul said, no, the law is not evil. The law is not sinful. It was just to show us how sinful we are. And some of those things may be good for you. It may be good for you to abstain from pork chops and all of that and from um, crawfish and all. But he's saying it's not going to do nothing for in here. It wasn't until the Lord died, Jesus died on the cross, and then came to Peter and said, do you love me? And you saw that sense of restoration take place in his life because Jesus said, the enemy desires to sift all of you as weak, but I pray for you that your faith, faith fail not. And Peter, when you are converted, when you really get an inner change, I want you to strengthen your brethren. So that's one thing about Peter that really can be applied to our life. Just because you go to a building, it doesn't mean that you have something. Is it important for us to meet? Yes, it definitely is. Now, church buildings in the sense of what we know now, the early church was not familiar with that. They would meet in houses or they would meet in schools. They would meet wherever they could possibly get together. Um, they would meet on the temple steps uh, for teaching and instruction. And so we have all types of ways that we can meet in this particular day and time. Now let's talk a little bit about Peter's family, because again, this is the author of First and Second Peter. And you all helped to share because a lot of people wonder, well, what happened? Did he fall off the face of the earth again? Everything went dead. Everything went dead. Everything went, that really shocks me. Everything went dead except the Android, and that is amazing. You all think I'm just saying that, because believe you me, I'm not an Android fan at all. But everything went dead except Android kept, I mean, people were on the, on the live center page just saying, hey, everything, everything is fine. I'm like, this is shut off, that shut off, that's all shut off. They said, we're fine, we're still here. They never did leave. And so that is just amazing. So please share this right now with everybody and let them know that we are back on the line and we're going to finish up this lesson. I understand if some have to come and go, but it's important that I finish this because, number one, I don't start nothing and don't finish it. I believe in following through. Number two, there are people that are studying these lessons every night, and I want to make sure that um, they don't miss out on the information. Now, Peter, uh, his dad's name was John. John 21 and 5, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We don't know a lot about his father other than his name was John. His name was John, and he had a son named Simon, and he had a son named Andrew. And it was actually um, Peter's brother, Andrew, that led him to Jesus Christ. Um, they were actually uh, followers of John the Baptist. The Bible says John 1, 35 through 43. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And uh, I'm, I'm ignoring that Eric Tobias because they're trying to bring me over there and convert me to Android. I just said Android didn't let me down right now, but I didn't say I was coming over to the other side. So it says the next day there was John and two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and said, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Uh, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of those two that heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon, talking about Peter, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he, Andrew, brought him, Peter, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, Peter, and said, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now, what, what does that say to us? A lot of times um, we may get frustrated because we don't play the same part that somebody else plays in life. But understand, 
the scripture talks about entering into the labors of other men. And so Andrew, really, because he's the one that brought Peter to Christ, I truly believe that he will share. You can't comment. You hear, but I'm frozen on your end. Okay, I really think that's your... Can somebody tell Joanne Maxie that that's on her end? Because everything is fine on this end now. We've got that uh, straightened out. Um, yeah, God bless you, Luck Lady Pearson. I appreciate you much. Um, Andrew, I truly believe, is going to share in whatever reward it is that Peter gets because Andrew is the one that led Peter to the Lord. And understand, that's why I say, Jacqueline Maria, we look at the um, role that we play in the body of Christ, and sometimes when we compare it to others, we say it's not as significant as what is going on in someone else's life. But understand, all of us do have a role. If it wasn't for Andrew, Peter would have never came to Christ. You know, Peter's mending, you know, his nets doing everything that he's doing. But it was Andrew that listened to the teaching of John the Baptist. And if you want to be technical, John the Baptist is the one that said, look, that's the Lamb of God. Look, that's the one that came to save us. Andrew then goes to Peter and says, look, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one that we have been looking for. It goes back to our theme text, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. We have found the one that's going to reconcile us to God. We have found the one that is going to bring us in right relationship with God. And so it's important to understand you have to grow where you're planted, appreciate what it is that God is doing in your life, and know that whatever it is he has you to do, it is something significant. No, we don't talk a whole lot about Andrew. We don't, we don't talk a whole lot about him. Yeah, sometimes people get mixed up on that. Uh, Sherry Frost says sometimes it gets mixed up between the Peter and the Simon, but his name was Simon, and Jesus gave him the nickname Peter or Cephas, which literally means a rock. Um, and it, it may pertain to the stability of his character. It also may pertain to the revelation that he got that Jesus is the son of God. Notice, and that's important, notice, 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 notice. In John 1, 36, when John points out to Andrew and the other disciple that's following John, he says, look, the Lamb of God. And then Andrew later goes on and tells his, his brother Peter in John 1, 41, we have found the Messiah, we have found the anointed one. But it wasn't until later on that they realized that the Messiah is not just going to be this great savior of the world or savior of the Jewish people, but this Messiah is God himself in flesh. Oh my goodness, that, that's, that's the revelation of this. Now let's go on further about Peter. And this will help you to understand when you hear Peter talking, what perspective he's talking from, because he talks pretty strong in his epistles. It says, um, according to the text, according to the scripture, Peter was married. Now, some people really get this mixed up when they talk about Peter because they'll say, <coughs> excuse me, he left his wife to follow Jesus. That is a misinterpretation of the text. Peter was married and his wife traveled with him. He had a very strict view of the home life and he felt that, um, you know, things should be really strict between the husband and wife, but apparently he was a respectful husband. He felt the wife had a role. He felt the husband had a role, but he was very respectable, even though he felt that the woman was the quote unquote weaker person. And there's many ways that that can be taken. That can be taken very offensively. It's been proposed to mean the morally weaker or the physically weaker when you say morally weaker in the sense of um, Eve is the one that was deceived and, you know, all of that. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, some say it may refer to being physically weaker, but every man is not necessarily robust and strong. Every lady is not necessarily really weak physically. It's also been stated that it means that she is precious, which means she's to be handled Delicately, Watch it, Erica Tobias. <laughs> but whatever it means, Peter was respectful to his wife. I will say this. He was respectful to his wife because he felt that a husband's prayers would be hindered if the husband did not honor the wife. So I can say that about Peter in looking at his life. Obviously, the man had a direct relationship with God because in Acts chapter 10, 
God gives them the revelation that the Gentiles are coming to the church. So prayer is communication with God. Obviously, there was an open line of communication between him and God. So obviously, he honored his wife. And so that's why he was blessed. So Peter had a very strict, very strict view on how the home life was to be um, handled. And you give respect, you get respect. I mean, look at my wife. I mean, I don't know how fast she was driving, but she got here in a short amount of time, you know, and hey, what's going on? Because people didn't know what was happening with the, um, you know, signal and everything going out. Again, it's just storms and everything that are getting ready to brew through here. But again, you give respect, you get respect. You reap what you sow, Galatians chapter six, verse seven. Paul stated that Peter's wife traveled with Peter. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 5, it says, don't I have a right to follow the example of the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Peter by taking a Christian wife with me on my trips? So I want to say this, um, email that to me, Sister Sherry Frost, ehankerson, iii, at kojic.org. Um, this notion or this belief that Peter had left his wife to travel all over the place and um, just totally left everything. What, what it's literally meaning is he gave his life completely to Christ. He gave his life completely to the Lord. But obviously, I mean, you see it in the end of um, the gospel according to St. John, Peter's still fishing, you know. So, so when we say drop your nets, in other words, put me first, consecrate your life to me and I'll make you fishers of men, but Peter still would fish, and he did not leave his wife. He did not leave his family. So again, for those people that have that notion that in order to serve God, you got to neglect your family, neglect your spouse, that is absolutely false doctrine and false teaching. Well, the only way I can be really consecrated is I got to leave my family. That's a crazy thing. First Corinthians 9 and 5, I'm going to read it again. Don't I have the right to follow the example of the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Peter by taking a Christian wife with me on my trips. Again, Peter was faithful to his spouse and he also had a very strong view of how a house is to be set up. He said in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, and this is gonna sound very harsh. He says, in the same way, you wives should be willing to serve your husbands. Then even those who have refused to accept God's teaching will be persuaded to believe because of the way you live, you will not need to say anything. Your husbands will see the pure lives that you live with respect to God. It's not the fancy hair, the gold jewelry, the fine clothes that should make you beautiful. Nor should your beauty come from, um, no, no, your beauty should come from inside you. The beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, that beauty will never disappear. It's worth very much to God. It is the same way the holy women who lived long ago followed God. They made themselves beautiful in that same way. They were willing to serve their husbands. I'm talking about women like Sarah. This is Peter talking. She obeyed Abraham, her husband, and even called him her master. I can hear the church getting real quiet right now. <laughs> and you women are true children of Sarah if you always do what is right and you're not afraid. But even though he had that real strict view in regard to how the home life was supposed to be set up, as far as the woman's role, listen how strict he is on the men. He says, in the same way, you husbands should live with your wives in an understanding way, since they are weaker than you. And again, there's all types of interpretations on that. He said, you should show them respect because God gives them the same blessing he gives you. So in other words, it's the same blessing between husband and wife and the grace of true life. Do this so that nothing will stop your prayers from being heard. So he's basically saying, Andrew Thompson, if you don't do what's right by your wife, God is not going to hear your prayers. So Peter um, was not only in good standing with his wife, Peter was also in good standing with his mother-in-law. So he had to be definitely a good, you, you, you think that his mother-in-law would have anything to do with him and, and he's mistreating her daughter? Not so. Luke chapter 4, 38 through 39 says this, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, mind you, again, if you look at the home of Peter there in Capernaum, and you, when you visit the Holy Land, you will see that the synagogue is just really a few feet away. You know, it's really like, yeah, cold spirit, Eric Lowry says. Um, 
And, and that, that's important because we always, I've always heard in church them beating up on the ladies, but there's the role of the men also. You know, our prayers will not be heard if we don't do what's right by our wife, and I really believe by our kids as well. So you can't neglect your family. So again, for these preachers that are sleeping around on their wives, going outside of their marriage, um, and doing all these things, I don't care how good they preach, God's not hearing those prayers. Hankerson, how can you say it? It's, it's in the book. He says, do this so that nothing will stop your prayers from being heard. So if you don't do what's right by your wife, I don't care how large your ministry is. And really, God cut everybody down to size. I don't care if you have 10,000 members or 10 members. Everybody's cut down to size now, you know. And really, it's been an eye-opener. Now, what, what really bothers me is everybody can't wait to go back to business as usual. I mean, these people aren't seeing what's going on at all. Now you got folks going into their anniversaries and all. I'm like, anniversary? You should have a thank you Jesus uh, celebration for him bringing us through this and bringing us out of this or go somewhere and sit down and deal with this post-traumatic stress from all of this, what we've gone through. So the first thing you can think about is your annual day. You know, and I have nothing wrong with blessing the, the man or woman of God. I mean, I'm obviously a man of God, so there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that. But if we're coming out of a pandemic, the first thing that we can think about is the pastor's anniversary. The first thing we can think about is the annual love day, the annual service. It's just nauseating. I mean, I feel nauseating just talking about it. I told y'all I got this letter here. I didn't throw it away, but this letter here from this guy talking about, oh, my pastoral anniversary. I said, and bring your choir, your A and B. So I'm, I'm not, we just got out of a pandemic and you talking about an anniversary and an A and B selection, you know, uh, that, that just, the whole letter just need to be thrown in the toilet someplace, you know, cause that's all it is. It's just ridiculous. That kind of mindset. We're not catching that. Just like Peter, you had all these external things, but yet he says, when he comes into contact with the living God, I'm a sinful man. I don't have it together. God help me. And so really, that's what these lessons are doing. They're showing us ourselves. And we try to, I mean, how many of you have ever heard a sermon preached on 1 Peter 3 and 7? 1 Peter 3 and 7. Husbands, if you don't treat your wife right, then do I have the most holy water? No, I got the most holy um, green apple water <laughs> and Pepsi. <laughs> so how many of you ever heard a sermon preached on that? You know, I hear preachers all the time, get a woman ain't got no business preaching, all that kind of, I, I hear all those things, but there's the flip side to it. The flip side to it is we've got to do what's right, and I believe our ministry starts at home. We are no stronger than our ministry at home. I don't care how successful we seem, you know, because success, how man sees it, is totally different from how God sees it, okay? So again, Peter had to do what's right if his mother-in-law is willing to go into his house. It says in Luke 4, 38 through 39, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over and rebuked the fever and it left her and she got up at once and began to wait on them. There is so much in that verse. Luke 4, 38 through 39, there's so much in that verse. You know, um, Peter's mother-in-law is in the house. So this lets me know that um, he respected her. She respected him. She was willing to stay in the house. You know, he wasn't having no fit uh, um, talking to his wife, talking about, hey, mom, there ain't, none, ain't there, my mama. She ain't staying in this house. You don't have, have all of that. She stays in the house. Peter's concerned about her. And they ask Jesus to help his mother-in-law. And then um, she gets healed and she gets up and starts waiting on him. She gets healed and it's like, okay, y'all want some biscuits? Let me get some biscuits cooking and, um, you know, some gravy. And, uh, hey, Pastor Hines, it's going to be turkey, turkey sausage because, you know, we don't eat no pork up in here. And so she gets up and starts waiting on them. She had to have been willing to do that because of how Peter carried himself. So even though Acts 4.13 says he was ignorant and unlearned, he did have some common sense. You, you can get all of that from the text. It's right in the text. Because if there wasn't a good relationship, that would not have occurred. To those of you on the Zoom, I'm going to have to let you go in two minutes. Uh, Minister Christopher Taylor is going to be teaching on the Zoom. I want you to continue, but I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to finish this, um, finish this uh, lesson. I was interrupted so rudely by the storm, knocked out the internet and all of that, but um, 
Everything except the Android, Deacon Colts, okay? Everything except the Android, but uh, all is well. Now, Peter was a professional fisherman. He caught freshwater fish for a living, but even though he caught freshwater fish for a living, this was his livelihood. What's amazing about him, uh, bless you, Charles Robinson, I understand. What's amazing about him is that fact that he's willing to obey God no matter what. Now, he knew his trade. Uh, it says in Matthew 4, 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net in the lake for they were fishermen. So Peter's brother was a fisherman. He was a fisherman, Andrew, as well as Peter, the sons of Simon. Now, Jesus was a carpenter in Mark 6 and 3. So in Luke 5 and 5, Jesus comes along and tells Peter, who is an expert fisherman, to cast his net out and he's gonna catch a whole bunch of fish. And so Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked all night long and we haven't caught anything. You know, in a, in a roundabout way, he's really saying, you know, I know these waters, I've grown up around these waters, I live around these waters, I fish for a living. But here's the thing, you may be a carpenter, but because you say so, I'm gonna let down my net. All right, and speaking of that, um, Zoom, let me let you go right now, and Minister Christopher Taylor's got that covered, and you all carry on, and I'll be on in just a little bit, okay? God bless. Uh, li li listen, listen, can you imagine this is your livelihood? You are a fisherman, and this man, Jesus, is a carpenter. Now, you want to build a garage, you want to build a house, um, you want to set up the frames for a structure. Okay, Jesus, you got that covered. I know about fishing. But that wasn't Peter's attitude. So, you know, we say all kinds of things about people. You know, they're like this, they're like that. Peter, are you seeing what I'm saying? Peter was respectable. So regardless of the opinions that people may have about a certain type of person, when you really get to know them for yourself, how many of you have ever been judged by people where they think you're a certain way? You're like, that's not me at all. They think your personality is a certain way. You're like, that's not me at all. And so through the th couple thousand years, we built up this persona of Peter that he's just so stubborn and his name, his nickname means the rock. And so he's not willing to listen to anybody. He was willing to listen to Jesus no matter what. That's it, Rosemary Lockett. If Jesus said it, that's it. So let's not say that about Peter. He was so stubborn, he wouldn't listen. We've just learned tonight from the Bible. This is not something I'm making up. We've just learned tonight from the Bible. He was, he was a respectable husband. He took care of his wife. Um, his his mother-in-law um, had high regard by him and he was willing to do whatever the Lord said to do even if it was something that in the natural Elizabeth Danner it would look like it went beyond that person's expertise Jesus you're a carpenter you're not a fisherman but because you said so that's it if you said to do it I'm going to do exactly what you said and I think that is a great quality to have again the only thing we hear about Peter is he carried a knife, he cussed so bad you couldn't put it in the Bible, and he got up on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people got saved. We just limit people based on what we know. And know in life, you're going to have that. People are going to limit what they think that you're capable of doing. There's a lot of people that, you know, may think that you don't have all the expertise and skill that you have, not even appreciate. And they may know, but just could care less. But understand, if God... His hand is on your life. Um, understand, if they did that to Peter, they're going to do that to you. And God's hand is on your life, and that's all that matters. He's going to use you mightily for his glory. Now, yes, Peter was outspoken, and that's the thing that we like to say about Peter. He was outspoken. Um, in Matthew chapter 14, 27 through 28, everybody else is quiet. Peter says, bid me to come. If it's you, tell me, and I'll come out on that water with you. In Matthew 17, verse 3 through 5, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter speaks up. Let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In Acts chapter 1, 15 through 17, folks are trying to sit there and consecrate and prepare for what God is going to do in their life. Peter gets up and has an election. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, while the Holy Ghost is being poured out, um, people are saying these folks are drunk and, and, and they're full of new wine. But Peter speaks up and said, no, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So, yes, he was outspoken. But do you know also that he was respectable? Do you know also that 
he knew how to treat his wife? Do you know also that he was faithful to his wife? Do you know also that his wife traveled around with him? Do you know also that he was a professional? Do you know also that um, he spent so much time with Jesus that even though he didn't have this massive education, he could yet just by his life exemplify that Jesus was the head of his life. How many of us, people can look at us and say, just like they said in Acts 4.13, this man has been with Jesus. Now, Peter was just a cussing, sword carrying, outspoken, big mouth, whatever. And I'm, oh, they talk so bad about Peter. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that that's somebody that's been with Jesus, but Acts 4.13, Sister Jackson, I'm reading it out the Bible. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Peter's life was so exemplary that the people marveled about that. That doesn't sound like some cussing, sword carrying, big mouth, stubborn, obnoxious individual. I mean, how many people look at us and marvel? Well, they're supposed to look at Jesus. Yeah, but they, they can only see Jesus through us. <laughs> those of us that are Christians, those of you that are not Christians, that's where we're teaching this lesson, believe in God that you'll come into the faith. But they marveled. Hello from Italy. How are you doing, Elias? Good to see you. Had somebody from France the other day, too, even tonight. Um, they marveled that they had actually been with Jesus, and that is so amazing. Good to have you from Italy as well because it's believed that Peter wrote 1 Peter from Rome, which is in Italy. So isn't that amazing that we have a friend on here tonight all the way from Italy? Hey, Renee Holscher, that's my uh, former manager out there, Joyce Meyer. So good to see you. So that is just amazing. That is amazing to me. That is amazing to me that we can look at a person, people can look at you, and they can perceive, oh, you're like this. Or maybe they hold your past against you. Well, I remember when, but you're somebody different now. And so if people will hold the past against Peter for 2,000 years, don't you get bent out of shape thinking, okay, I'm being prejudged by everybody and they're thinking this about me and thinking that about me. You, you can't stop and worry about that. Peter did not stop. He kept moving forward. Now, people don't preach on that text, Acts 4.13 that they marveled at them, that they had been with Jesus. You don't hear people quote that, but you hear about the sword and him cutting off the ear of Malchus, the high priest servant. You hear about that. Taylor Shante, you hear about, you know, how he cussed so bad. You know, of course, the term is curse, but really cursing and cussing at one time were really considered almost the same thing. It was an oath. And so what he literally was doing was um, calling oaths down upon himself, calling, you know, cursing himself. If, if I know Jesus, then let a tree fall on me. Taylor Shante, you're okay. What happened tonight? There was a, I was talking about a storm, and a storm is on the way here, and it actually came through, knocked the whole internet off. So I'm actually 30 minutes behind. I'd actually started teaching, and uh, you better watch that. And I actually started teaching. The thing went off, and it takes so long to you know, start everything back up again. So you're, you're fine. I'm actually going later tonight because I had to come back on and start later. But those things did happen with Peter. Yes, he could be violent. John 18 and 10, he struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. Um, he was not as strong as he thought. Matthew 26, 31 through 35, Jesus told him, this night all of you are going to fall away. For it's written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock are going to be scattered. But after I've risen, go ahead in Galilee. Peter replied, even if everybody falls away on account of you, I never will. So... <laughs> He did have some rough edges because Peter just threw all the disciples under the bus. I don't care. Andrew leaves you, Bartholomew, and, 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 and all of them, John, James. If all of them leave you, I don't care if the rest of the inner circle leaves you, I'm sticking with you. Peter replied, if they all fall away, I'm never going to do it. Truly, I tell you, Peter, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me. And you're going to do it three different times. God bless you, Sister Mary Wilson. Is that uh, Mary Wilson from uh, Tacoma? Let me know. 
Now, Peter had a bold, strong relationship with Jesus Christ, obviously, because when you look at Acts 4.13, the people marvel that he'd been with Jesus. Let that be a takeaway from this lesson, among many others. We want to be so close to him that people marvel that we've been with him. They marvel, watch this, that we have, <laughs> that we have, what do you call it, um, manners. They marvel that we know how to say please. They marvel that we know how to say thank you. Um, I'm wondering nowadays, can you all help me with this? Do people teach manners anymore? Do people teach manners anymore? You know, you go to the gas station, hold the door open so that somebody else can go in, boom, they just go walking right in. You just feel like turning that quick trip door loose and pushing it, boom! <laughs> Ankerson, you wouldn't do that. You know the devil will speak to anybody. But I mean, I, I'm just being nice and just, you know, I could just go in and out and don't have to worry about you, but I'm holding it open for you and you're just going to walk in, not even say thank you. Um, I was in the store getting some essentials and it's, oh, it's a sense of entitlement. Yeah, it's a sense of entitlement that someone has to do something. Because I was in the store the other day, of course, social distancing, my mask and all of that. And so I was getting ready to come out of one aisle and there was this aisle here and... Um, I saw a lady coming, so I just stopped, you know, because that's what I was taught. You see a lady, let the lady go first. She just kept right on walking. I'm like, well, you're welcome. I didn't say that, but I'm like, where are the manners at? Where are the manners at? And I think just little small things like that, little small things like that um, will make a big difference in the world that people will marvel. Oh, here's someone, you said please, you said thank you, you, you have some manners. You didn't just say, well, give me this, but even how we treat people in, in restaurants, as the restaurants are opening up, you know, as, as we go into restaurants, the waiters and, and waitresses are not there just to be at all of our beck and call. I mean, those are real life people that have families and they probably would rather be with their family than jumping every time you, uh, 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 hey, hey, come over here. We don't talk to people like that as believers. Hey. Hey, and I've seen anointed Holy Ghost roto -bo 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 folks that talk in all kind of tongues, say things like that. Hey, you know, and that's really not uh, most times if you act mannerly, most times the response is mannerly. Teach our children by example. Yeah, so we have to be an example. And I believe you may say, well, what does that have to do with being with Jesus? We're to be filled with loving kindness. His loving kindness is better than life. Loving kindness his tender mercies endure forever. So if the Lord is kind, we should be kind as well. And then people will marvel, man, these folks are so nice. But the criticism many times is that Christian people, we are the most mean-hearted individuals that you can ever find. Understand this, being holy and being mean are two different things. We think a lot of times the meaner we are, that shows oh, I'm holy, I'm I'm holy. I had five hours of prayer this morning. I read through um, three books of the Bible this morning. I fasted the last 40 some odd days. I went to the top of Mount Sinai and I came down glory and wilderness and um, I have this great revelation from God and we think being mean will draw people to Christ. Being mean is not, being holy does not be, mean being mean. Being holy does not mean being rude. And so that's one of the things I'd love to see as a result of this webcast that we've been doing these last 11 weeks and going through the books of the Bible. Um, man, if we could just be kind, if we could just be kind hearted, have some manners and try to. And it's difficult. It's difficult. I'm going to be honest. It's difficult because if other folks are being rude, the natural human reaction is, OK, you're rude. I'm going to be rude right back to you. Like I said, I'm opening up the door so that you can walk in. And if you just walk in, oh, you didn't say, yeah, you, 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 you just walked in and <laughs> didn't say, <"Poof!" laughs> but you can't do that. You, you can't fight meanness with more meanness. We, we, we have to act different. We have to act different. Our acting different doesn't save us. Okay, it's not in the acts, but if there's truly been a heart change, it's going to be exemplified in every single day life. We need to change that persona. How many of you are believers that would say, we're going to help change that persona? We're going to change that persona of church people that we are really some kind people. We really do 
love people along with loving God. Because there's a lot of people that say, hey, I love God with all my heart. I just can't stand people. How can we be in ministry and cannot stand people? So let's, 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 let's do like Peter. Again, I know he's got a bad rap. I know that we talked about how violent he is. I know that we, <laughs> Gloria and Willing to say, can we shake the dust? I know that he's got all of these idiosyncrasies about him. But please give the man some credit. Acts 4.13, the people looked and marveled that this person, that's right, a heart change, had been with Jesus. They didn't marvel at um, how he was able to quote the books of the Bible. They didn't marvel at how he was able to speak Greek. You know, they didn't marvel at how many miracles he worked, but they marveled at the fact that this guy is acting like Jesus. And, and Taylor Shante, that's what I want. Mary Wilson, that's what I want. I want people to look and say, hey, Wayne Allen, that's right. I want people to look and say, this man sounds like he has been with the Lord. Now, you're not always going to bat 100. There's times you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. You know, there's times where, you know, for example, it's hot right now. It's, it's hot right now. Somebody might say, well, Hankerson, turn on the air condition. A 25,000 square foot building, turn on the air condition just to cool this um, one little area. No. And so there's some people, watch this, there's some people that, you know, if it's hot, they're just mean, you know, some, you know, a lot of us, they, they tell me, according to the stats of this webcast, that there's people between 35 to 65 that are um, watching, mostly. And there's some younger, there's some older. But they'll say, well, there's a certain time in life when a lady, you know, has a changes that happen in her. And not only that for ladies, but for men also. We get to a certain age where we're just, we're just grumpy just because we feel like it, Albert Dickens. We just... Just feel like being grumpy today. <laughs> yeah. Just feel like being grumpy. How you doing? Uh, what you want to eat? Uh, you know. So you're not always going to bat 100. But the thing is, that's where studying the word, being in the presence of God, helps to transform us and keep us on the right track. Again, what we do is not going to save us. However, if we're truly saved, then what we do is going to be different. Put that in the comment section, those that would say, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Because I know sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm just at a certain age, and when it gets hot, you know, I'm just, uh, I had one lady in the church, this was in Springfield, I don't know whether Tina McBrayer is still on there, there was one lady in the church, I mean, she hit that time, and I mean, I think she tried to open up a can of tomatoes, and couldn't get the can of tomatoes open, she had a meltdown, she had a total meltdown, because she couldn't have the can, couldn't open up the can of tomatoes, and I mean it was, <laughs> you know, they were like pray for sister so and so and so because she was trying to open up a can of tomatoes and just lost it. So even even with you know your 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 body being out of whack, your emotions being out of whack, whether you're male or female, you know we need to bless the Lord. Oh my soul and all that is within me. What's my soul? That's my emotions, my will, my reasoning, as well as my intellect. It is all being devoted to God. So Peter left everything to follow Jesus, which literally means that he consecrated himself to Jesus. He did not neglect his family. Matthew 4, 18 through 20, he left all to follow him. Um, he was a part of Jesus' inner circle. Mark chapter 14, verse 33, um, Jesus personally prayed for him. I forget the name of the lady, Tim McBride. I forgot the name of the lady. Um, but yeah, she just, she had a meltdown. I forget her name, but I can see her face. In Luke 22, 31 through 32, Jesus tells Peter, I have prayed for you, Simon. I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Isn't that amazing to have Jesus to pray with you, pray for you? And as a result of his calling upon his life, he became a powerful man of God. Galatians 2 and 9 tells us that he was one of the pillars of the church. Jesus even built the church upon the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what I'm about to say is going to offend a whole lot of people, but I must stick with the scriptures. Mark, Matthew chapter 6, 13 through 18, Jesus comes to Caesarea Philippi. He asks the disciples, who do people say I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or the other of the prophets. But what do you say? So Simon Peter answers President Hines, and he says, you are the Messiah. Watch this, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because 
Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. The church is not built upon Peter because we say, okay, Peter's name, the nickname Jesus gave him means rock. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. No, the church is built on the rock of the revelation that Jesus is the son of God. Mind you, when Andrew, we read earlier, comes to get Peter, he says, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. We found the anointed one. But Peter here in Caesarea Philippi says, you are the Messiah. So he affirms what his brother Andrew had told him before this. He affirms that this is the Messiah. But he says, wait a minute. I just realized something. You're not just a long-awaited Messiah. You're not just a great prophet. You're not just a great teacher. You're actually, wait a minute. You're God's son. You are God in human flesh. Peter, you can almost imagine Jesus rejoice. Oh, Peter, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. You got it. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But my father, which is in heaven, we're going to learn as we study the epistles in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John tomorrow night, Elder Tyler, that you have to acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God or else you cannot have eternal life. Not just that he's a prophet. Realize this, every religion in the world, Elder Segal, acknowledges that Jesus was a great man. They all acknowledge that he was a great teacher. They all acknowledge that he was a great prophet. This was a messenger of God. Some will say that he was somewhere in between divine and human, but he wasn't fully divine. They will say, well, he, he reached this exalted state, so he's higher than most humans, and he's along the lines of the other great prophets, but he is not fully God. But Peter says, no, you're not just the anointed one that is to come. You are God in flesh. You are the son of God. And you must be the son of God because if not, we cannot be saved. And the reason why is because with you being human, you can die on the cross for our sins. But with you being God, you can arise again the third day. Like the song says, living you love me, dying you save me, buried you carry my sins far away, rise and you justified me. And so that's the revelation that he caught. Now, of course, he puts his foot in his mouth the next minute. But just, just consider, um, Jesus had to call him the devil, basically. You know, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not talking about the things that be of God, um, but you're talking about the things that be of the devil. So I mean, get behind me. So how is it, can it, can it be that one minute you get this revelation from God, the next minute Jesus is calling you the devil? Um, understand, he wasn't really referring to him as the devil. He was talking about that spirit through him, that spirit that was working through him. And yeah, Renee Holscher, that is so true. If you don't watch yourself, one minute you can be so anointed, the next minute you can be talking on behalf of the devil. And so you have to keep yourself on guard. Don't think that because you have this mountaintop experience with God, all of a sudden you can let your guard down because that enemy is waiting. Um, I keep telling these stories, but here's another one, Sister Tina McBrayer. Remember we had a certain brother in the church, I ain't gonna call his name because he was a, He's become a great man of God, but he'd backslide every service. He would backslide every, what you mean, Hankerson? He would come into the service, have a wonderful time. The Lord would bless him. He'd get out of church. Somebody would make him mad, and I mean, he would talk in a language that wasn't tongues, and he just let him have it. He would lose his blessing every time. He would lose his blessing every time. And so realize that when you have a mountaintop experience with God, that's the, hey, Bishop Doss, that's the principle that you need to get from that. Be on guard when you have that mountaintop experience because there's always something waiting to take it. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a sower that goes out to sow seed and some of it falls by the wayside and the birds of the air, boom, they come and they take it. So as soon as this word is being sown into your life, realize the enemy is going to do everything he can to take it. There may be some of you listening right now that you hear that, oh, yes, I need to be kind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, Lord Jesus, I need to be kind. Yes, Hankerson, I need to be kind. I need to be more like Jesus. You get that blessing, turn the webcast off, somebody makes you so mad. You know what? 
boom, and you forget about all of this blessing and all this word, all this teaching <laughs> that you've received. It's gone just like that. Don't let the enemy come and steal that seed. Peter just gets this revelation. And to be honest, I really think he was sincere in what he was saying. He was just sincerely wrong. Jesus is talking about going to Jerusalem and dying. Peter's like, here he goes again with all of that dying stuff. No. But here's the thing. He calls Jesus aside and begins to rebuke Jesus. Now, you've gone too far now. Now, you can have a discussion with Jesus. You can have a talk with Jesus. But you're going to call Jesus aside and begin to rebuke him. He wasn't just sharing his thoughts and sharing his heart. And he may have been sincere, but he allowed another spirit to get in. And all of a sudden now I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to rebuke Jesus and let him know. Now, listen, you stop all that talk about you're going to die. Now, we've given our life to this and we've been going around with you and suffering with you and all of this. And you keep talking about dying, 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 dying. I won't hear nothing else about it. I'm not saying that's what he said, but a rebuke is a sharp reprimand. That's literally what a rebuke means. He reprimanded Jesus. He, he, he dealt with him almost like he was a child. Now, hold on just a second. So Jesus looks and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because you are savoring the things that be of the devil, not the things that be of God. And I'm not going to hear this anymore. So please understand, when God uses us, let's remain consecrated so that he can continue to use us. Jesus gives him the authority in Matthew 16 and 19. And again, I'm not attacking any religious body, but what I'm doing is just sharing with you what the word says. That's all I'm doing. So he's attacking. No, I'm not attacking any body. I'm just letting you know that the body of Christ cannot be built upon Peter. Peter was a faulty human being just like the rest of us. My faith is not built on Peter, but my faith is built on the revelation that Peter gave, that God gave him rather and ministered through him that Jesus is the son of God. And in Matthew 16 and 19, Jesus tells Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is literally talking about the fact that in Acts 2, 36 through um, 41, Acts 2, 36 through 41, Peter preaches that great message on the day of Pentecost and the Jews enter into the kingdom of God. Then in Acts 10, 46 through 48, Peter preaches at Cornelius' house and the Gentiles enter into the kingdom of God. So Peter did have a special place in the body of Christ in that sense that God used him to open up that door where Jew and Gentile could come into the body. And he literally was the apostle to the Jews, Galatians chapter two, verse eight. But it's not saying that, you know, because of that, he's to be worshiped or honored. Um, no human being is to be worshiped or honored. And I don't have to go through Peter or any of the saints in order to get to the Lord. Please understand that. We read it when we studied the epistle to the Hebrews. I can come boldly to God's throne and find help in the time of need because Jesus is my perfect sacrifice. And I know some people feel, well, you need those dead saints to pray to them because those prayers will help out what you are seeking to get God to do for you. But let me say this. If the blood of Jesus won't do it, nothing else will. I don't need to talk to Mary. If me going directly to God in the name of Jesus is not enough, then everything else is not going to help me. If, if, if he can't help me, if the Lord, if Jesus can't help me, if his blood can't help me, if his atonement can't help me, then nothing else will. I understand the mentality. Okay, let's get as many of these dead saints because they're already, and that's what the mentality in the teaching is of, of a particular religious denomination that those people are already in the presence of God. And so since they're already up there, then talk to them and they can talk um, to Jesus and Mary can talk to Jesus and all of them can get together and talk to the Father and perhaps your prayers will get answered um, even quicker. But again, if the blood of Jesus won't do it, Mary can't help me. Peter can't help me. None of these individuals can help me. You know, I can come boldly and talk to God directly myself. The veil in the temple was rent from, rent from top to bottom. So I can come boldly and talk directly with God in Jesus' name. And so please understand, I'm just strictly talking from the Bible that we don't have to go through all these intermediaries. 
And believe you me, there's a lot of people trying to do that because they feel like, well, God's not hearing me. Maybe if I ask some of these saints, you know, God hears you, but he may not be giving you the answer that you want, but he hears every prayer that you are praying. Uh, Instagram, you're going to go off and I'm going to bring you back on so we can finish up again. I'm behind tonight because I was off for about 20 minutes due to the fact that or 20 or 30 minutes due to the fact that the storm started taking uh, taking out the uh, program. Um, here's the thing. Peter lived to a ripe old age. And according to the Bible, what was going to happen at the end of his life, he was going to end up facing a, um, a time of uh, death, which he would definitely not. <laughs> he, he, he definitely would not find very uh, pleasurable. You know, he wasn't going to just sleep away into eternity, but he was going to experience a death that was going to be excruciating. Now, Peter did become an older man. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 1 that he was an elder. You all know I can multitask at the same time. The Bible says that he was an elder, meaning that he was a respectable older man. But Jesus tells him in St. John 21 verse 18, he says, very truly, I tell you, he says, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went wherever you wanted to go. But when you get old, you're going to stretch out your hands and someone else is going to dress you and they're going to lead you to where you do not want to go. This is literally talking about the fact that at the end of his life, he's going to be martyred for the gospel. And many traditions say that he was crucified upside down, that when he saw the cross, um, you know, that he was going to be crucified on. He said, no, I'm not worthy to be crucified by my Lord or, or by my Lord in the same manner that my Lord was. So crucify me upside down. Now, I'm strictly trying to stick with the text. The text does not say that, but the text does say that when he reached a certain age, he will be taken to a place that he does not want to go. And according to uh, many Bible scholars, that is referring actually to the end of his life. Now, let's close this out by looking at these letters. In 1 Peter, Peter is just encouraging the people to know that persecution is going to be great because of your faith and you must continue to live a consecrated life and in second peter he's coming against a lot of the false teaching that is starting to infiltrate the church at that time again peter is the apostle to the jews so this letter is being specifically authored for the jewish believers first peter chapter 1 verse 1 peter an apostle of jesus christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So he is literally talking to the Jewish believers, but the word still applies to you and I because we've been grafted in. You know, if you're a Jewish believer, praise the Lord. But for those of us that are Gentile believers, we've been grafted into the royal family. So everything that the Jews have, as far as the covenants, the blessings, and all that, it all comes down to us. The only thing is we don't have to keep the law because uh, in Acts 15, the church had a council and they determined that that, would not, that burden would not be placed upon the Gentiles, but only that we abstain from sexual immorality, we abstain from eating blood and things like that, um, and that we live pure, holy, and godly lives. They said that's basically the requirement that we have for the Gentiles. But as far as circumcision, as far as keeping the Torah, that is not placed upon the Gentile church. So he tells the people, listen, you're going to have to live right because there's a lot of corruption around you. You're in a pagan society and you're going to have to do the right thing. He says, be alert and be sober and set your hope and grace uh, that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ comes back as obedient children. Don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as the one that called you is holy, you need to be holy also in all of your conduct because the Bible says be holy because I am holy. So that goes back to being kind. That goes back to having some manners. Hey, bless you, Bishop White. So good to see you. Um, that's Bishop White Jr. God bless your heart. So God's people are to be holy. We're to grow. The Bible says like sincere newborn babes, 1 Peter 2 and 2, crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So we're not to be babies our entire life in Christ. Again, we don't want to be the type that the slightest thing causes us to fall away from the faith. You know, trials actually are to make us stronger. And that's what he's telling them here in 1 Peter. You're going to go through some difficult times, but allow it to make you stronger. Don't allow it to destroy you. Uh, let's see. I'll be done here in just a minute. I know we're a little bit later tonight due to the fact that... Um, 
the storm had brewed. That was one of the um, reporters that wants to interview me here in a few minutes, and I'll be with the mayor in just a little bit. He says, listen, believers are chosen not just by natural birth, but also by spiritual birth. It says that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in the sixth verse. Jesus is a chosen and precious cornerstone. Now that you believe, who believe this stone is precious, but those who do not believe the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special people that you may declare the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what he's literally saying is, you Jewish believers, I know you feel like you're chosen naturally, but understand you're chosen spiritually as well. And when it comes to being chosen spiritually, the Gentiles are a part of that also. So you can be from the tribe of Simeon. You can be from the tribe of Levi. But all of that doesn't mean anything if you don't have a relationship with God. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So don't indulge in sin like the people around you. He, he says, live good lives among the pagans that they may accuse you of doing wrong, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Submit yourselves to the Lord. He says, um, for the sake of human authority, whether to the emperor, the supreme authority, to the governors that are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. So he's saying there, because <laughs> this is a big battle that's going on right now, about um, you know whether they can tell us to shut the church down or not. Listen, the government hasn't told us to shut down Christianity. They haven't told us to shut down preaching. They haven't told us to stop the faith. As a matter of fact, the governor of Missouri, who he and I definitely don't see eye to eye, and we've met many times and say, oh, here you go again. So we don't see eye to eye. But one thing he will state is if the buildings had to be closed down for the safety of the people, get on social media, get online, present your message in that particular manner. So we're not dealing with a government that is telling us do not um, preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I say that because I had a preacher and I'm not going to call the preacher's name because he did apologize as long as he, you know, leaves that alone. Then then I don't need to go into that further about who he is. But I, I, I would like to use it as a teaching opportunity. I would like to use it as a teaching opportunity. And that is. You're not being told not to preach Jesus and him crucified, Bishop Perry. You're not being told that. And so to get on and rant and rave, Hankerson is wrong, but he didn't call my name, but he said president of the coalition. That's one of the uh, Kojic bishops. Well, who is the president of the St. Louis clergy coalition and, and, and one of the Kojic bishops, that's me. Um, you know, ranted and raved, you all need to be whipped and you all are t preaching fear to the people. You're not preaching faith. It is faith to shut down a church building and keep doing ministry and the people are still being ministered to and the building is still being maintained. That's faith. I told you all that yesterday. So please understand he's saying there, you know, do things in order when it comes to human authority. I know many of us like to speed and go past the speed limit and all of that, you know, and it's not saying to be like a Pharisee, you know, the speed limit says 25 and I'm going to go 20 and, you know, you're, you're becoming a hazard to traffic. But he's basically saying the principle is this. Christians ought not to be these wild lawbreakers that if there's a law, they're just going to break it. They're not going to pay any attention to it. He says your home life should be different. We read that from 1 Peter chapter 3 about how the wife is to act towards the husband, how the husband is to act towards the wife. He lets you know that your home should exemplify something different. And then he tells us suffer for doing good and not for doing evil. If you're going to have harm to come upon you, he said, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer, do it for what's right, not because you're doing what's wrong. Do what's right and you're going to be blessed. So first Peter four and one, he says, just like Christ suffered in the body, arm yourselves with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they don't live the rest of their earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So if I suffer, that's going to deliver me from sin. No, he's basically saying have that same mind that Christ had to totally give himself over to the will of his father. And if you totally give yourself over to the will of the father, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says, 
Listen, the end of all things is near. Be alert, be sober, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love, co love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean just do what we want to do and why well, got you covered. But if you love somebody, we're going to urge each other to do what's right in love, not encourage each other to do what's wrong. Oh, you don't have to pay attention to all that, what they're telling you at their church. Just live any kind of way you want to live. That's not loving somebody. But let the person know, man, you're better than that. Man, you got a wonderful wife at home, and you're going to slip here and just and go out and carouse and do all kind of things? Man, you, 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 got it, you got it made. Don't mess up what God has done in your life. That's, that's, that's really what it is as far as loving each other, covering a multitude of sins. What it basically means is that you're spurring each other on to do what is right. And he says, don't be, don't be shocked when you, when you have to suffer for this. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you as though some strange thing is happening to you. Yeah, do what's right. That's it, do what's right. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You suffer with him, you'll reign with him. You know, there's a blessing coming for the suffering that you're gonna to have to deal with. So church leaders also, be sincere, treat the people right. First Peter chapter five, I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. Shepherd the flock of God, which is under your care, watching over them, not because you have to, but because you're willing. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. That's what he wants you to do. Humble yourselves under the hand of God and God is gonna bless you. And so he lets them know here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, that I wrote this myself, just so you can know how important it is. And he closes out in 2 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2 by letting them know that false doctrine is going to try to infiltrate the church. But I want you to be firm in your faith. For this very reason, make effort, every effort to add to your faith goodness and knowledge and self-control and godliness, mutual affection. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. In other words, you have everything that you need in Jesus. So don't try to go after other false doctrines and false teachings in order to make it in life. Just add to what you have. Just add to what you have. Don't take away from it. Don't try to go off into something else, but stay with what you have. Make every effort to confirm your calling and to make it sure. Peter lets them know, I'm getting ready to get out of here. He says, I want to remind you of these things. He says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside. In other words, I'm going to soon die. I'm going to soon be out of here. As the Lord Jesus has made it clear to me, for which we read in St. John. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So he lets them know in 2 Peter 2, in the last days, there's going to be false prophets that, that are going to come. And in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over their head. But understand this. He says they're bold. They're arrogant. They have all kinds of sin that's happening in their life. They will be paid back harm with harm for the harm that they've done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight, not in the nighttime, but in the daylight. They're blots and blemishes with eyes full of adultery. They never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed. They know how to beat you out of your money. You know, I have people now that are trying to tell me, they say, Hankerson, you know, um, you can make all kind of money by uh, selling masks. Take the seal of your department, put it on there and sell those things, five, 10, $15, make all kind of money. I said, wait a minute, people are dying? And our governor, our mayor, our county executive, they're providing like maybe 375,000 masks that we are distributing to the people so that they can, to the leaders, so they can distribute to the people so that the people can be safe. We're dealing with people losing their lives. And the first thing on your mind is making some money. Like I said, it's one thing to be hustled out on the street. It's one thing to be hustled in the world. You shouldn't come to church and get hustled trying to figure out how is it that I can make a buck off of the saints. Shame on you. Shame on you. People are dying. And the only thing on our mind is how we can make money off of these people. We should be finding ways to 
bless the people. We should be finding ways to help save their lives. That's what my life is committed to. Let's help save these people's lives, not just try to get money out of them. You know, and like I said today, 25,000 masks were given out free of charge. You know, this coming Thursday, 100,000 masks are being given out free of charge, serving the people, serving the community, looking out for the safety of the people, not, okay, there's 10 of them, and if I can sell masks for $15 a piece, I'll have all kind of money. Shame, 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 shame. This is what Peter is talking about. They're experts at being greedy, experts at making money. And the, it, it, it takes money to operate. It takes money to do all these things, to have these lights and cameras and all of that. It takes money for the technology. It takes money to operate. I understand that. But there's a way to do it. But not to hustle the people of God. Not to hustle people like that. That's the, that's the things that the world does. If we're going to do the same thing the world does, what's the difference? Peter said, watch out for that. He said, dear friends, I'm letting you know Jesus is coming back. And know that in the last days, scoffers are going to come. They're going to come. But Jesus is coming back. They're going to tell you it's a myth, but the, he is coming back. Just understand this. Don't forget, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Be glory both now and forever. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with me. I had to go off for almost 20, 30 minutes or so um, due to everything shutting off. YouTube, I'm going to make sure that they have their lesson up there. But thank you so much for sticking and staying. I mean, I appreciate it. I don't know what all of your schedules are right now. Some of you may be watching while you're doing other things. You may be watching two or three webcasts at one time. But I just want you to know that we appreciate it. Uh, let me pray with those that want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And I'm about 15 minutes late for a newspaper interview that I have to do right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word. And we thank you for the opportunity to share it again, even after such a rude interruption by the storm and technology. Uh, but we thank you, God, for such a dedicated viewing audience that is, they've stuck with us from beginning to end. And we appreciate it. Bless them even now. And Father, I thank you that souls will be saved and added to the kingdom of God. If there's anyone right now that doesn't know Jesus and the parting of your sins, I invite you right now to stop what you're doing. Lift your hands to him in total surrender. Close your eyes and repeat after me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are the son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. You were buried in the grave. And three days later, God the Father raised you from the dead. Right now, Lord Jesus, I open to you the door of my heart and I receive you into my heart as my personal Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Lord, that I'm born again. Thank you that I'm a part of the family of God. Thank you that I'm a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. And I thank you now in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody put amen in the comment section and thank you so much for sticking and staying. Don't forget to send your prayer request to ehankersonii at kojic.org. And also please don't forget to uh, give your offering tonight, large or small. We ask everybody to give at least a $5 offering um, on these nights and we're almost finished. We're gonna make it through tomorrow night. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I will be starting early due to the fact of the International Men's Conference going on, but uh, we're going to, I'm determined to finish. We've had, I mean, Sunday night, we had hecklers on Periscope. They sought to derail everything. We kept on going. Last night on the Zoom, we had some hecklers that jumped on the Zoom. I mean, buck naked. You know, one person got on there and put their behind all on the uh, video and everything. I mean, an ugly disruption, an ugly disruption. But I kept right on teach, uh, teaching. I didn't let you all know <clears throat> all of what was happening, you know, but um, we made it through that. Tonight we made it through this, and we're going to keep on making it through. I'm determined I'm going to finish this, this lesson. If, <coughs> excuse me, if things cut off and I have to get, off, get on on 12, 12 midnight, I'll do it. But we're going to make it through this entire lesson series. I'm not going to let nothing stop us. And so tomorrow night will be in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 
Thursday in June, and then Friday night we'll give you a summary of the book of Revelation, which we taught a whole series on. We'll do a summary in one night, and then we'll get ready to, um, oh, bless you, yeah, my baby girl and her, now, now see, you're going to make me cry, Vivian, and I'm not even a crier either, but yeah, my baby girl, uh, I was her escort, um, her, um, the young man that was going to take her to the prom, um, oh, probably about 15 minutes early, about 15 minutes early. Uh, the young man that was going to take her to the prom was coming all the way from England, and um, that didn't get a chance to, that didn't get to happen due to COVID-19. And so my wife was so um, full of ingenuity that she had photos taken, and uh, she said, I want you to be uh, Raquel's escort. And so I was her escort, and uh, just as pretty as she can be, my little, my little bouncing baby girl. I, I know you all say, well, she's an 18-year-old adult. No, that's my little baby girl. And... When she gets 58, um, then uh, you said, zoom me out. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, it was something else. Um, so anyways, I thank God for that. So bless you all. I'm going to have to go because I got to get on this interview, but I thank you all so much. Also, there's an interview coming out in the Washington Post, I think probably by Friday. So when you see that, do me a favor and help to kind of spread the good word that preachers are doing some good things in the community. People have so much to say about um, um, preachers and everything like that, but we are really seeking to um, um, make a difference. And what you can do, you can go to um, go to my page and see that picture of uh, Raquel and, me, and myself. Uh, that's on my Facebook personal page and the fan page, and on Instagram as well, and on Twitter. All right, God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Bless us as we leave this place, but never from your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. God bless you every time we turn around. God is blessing us. You have a wonderful evening.